Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 16. In the verses that follow, Jesus is vindicating and explaining John the Baptist to the generation that went out to see him. And in verse 16, he begins to squeeze. And he gets very direct with the generation that went out to see him. And he says this, what shall I, to what shall I compare this generation? It's, it's so demeaning what he says. It's, your generation is like children, like little kids sitting in a marketplace and saying to their playmates, <laughs> their playmates. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. And we sang a dirge, and you didn't mourn. What Jesus is emphasizing here is that there's, there's two dimensions of both John and Jesus' ministry that were offensive to their generation. And there was a unresponsiveness. On one hand, a flute is a happy melody. Like we played the flute and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't, a dirge, a funeral dirge. It's wailing and mourning. And, but you didn't mourn. And he goes on in verse 18 and says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, look at him, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors or regime collaborators, and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce cities. He began to denounce cities. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? This is his hometown. He's now beginning to say, You're, my hometown is going to be leveled in the coming military invasion. Jesus goes from John the Baptist to military invasion. And I'm starting verse 16 and 17. We're not going to stay here, but I want to frame where we're going to go this morning with verse 16 and 17. And to reference this obscure passage in the book of Revelation where John is commanded to eat the scroll for it is bitter and sweet that there's both a sweetness to the message that we proclaim and a bitterness to it. And this morning we're going to look at, it's going to, this morning's going to be very bitter. There's not going to be pretty much anything sweet about what we look at, but I think it's very necessary for our understanding of what we're talking about when we say the end of the age, when we talk about Jacob's trouble, when we talk about the great tribulation, these, you know, esoteric terms that we all hear the words and go, oh yeah, we know what that means. I think it's important to understand the details of these events. So what we're going to look at today is actually the details of the great tribulation in, let's say, practical territorial terms. The impact, specifically the impact of this on the state of Israel and the impact of this time on the Middle East and the impact of this on the international community once it begins to unfold in quite a practical way. And I want to say at the beginning, it's almost going to come across like a clinical uh, military briefing in a way, um, because I, I, not because I'm, un, I'm unemotional about this, 
but because I think for the sake of clarity and understanding what we're talking about, it's, I, it's going to be kind of like reading out a list almost as in retrospect of what happened in the same way that if today we were to outline the series of events that led to World War II, for example, and then what happened in World War II, what cities fell, when, how, who clashed with who, what was the geopolitics behind it. And my reason for doing this is not because I have some weird um, fetish with uh, the heavier parts of the eschatological story, but because I think it's one of the most underdeveloped and neglected subjects in the body of Christ. I think it's, it is, we've, we've heard the flute. We've heard the flute. You can hear the flute on, from any pulpit in America tomorrow morning. You can hear it, but the dirge, we're not hearing the dirge. And because we don't hear the dirge, you can't respond to it. You should mourn. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. And here's, here's the dynamic. If we don't taste the bitter, you're, have you actually tasted the sweet anyway? And I don't think that the church in America has eaten the scroll and has tasted the sweetness of the thing because we haven't tasted the bitterness of the thing. And so when we talk about the good news of the gospel, a big part of it, we know heaven and hell and the cross, but we haven't talked about the tangible, practical realities of what we mean when we talk about the end of the age, which is crazy because when we say your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven or Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, what we're praying for is specifically geopolitical military events that will unfold in the Middle East and affect real people's lives. It's not a concept in the sense of, you know, we say Maranatha and we're just going to kind of close our eyes and it's, it's, I know it's going to be cool because we get to see Jesus. Yes, we get to see Jesus at the end of the thing. But the impact of the time of Jacob's trouble and the great tribulation on real people's lives and actual nation states and cities and communities is very, very real. And I think if the Maranatha message is going to touch us, it needs to touch us not just in the flute way, because we can sing the Maranatha songs in major keys, you know, and we can feel the joy, and we should feel the joy of it and feel the longing for that day. But it's also, if we're going to be a people who accurately represent the message to the nations, and if we're actually going to be a people who embody the message and carry it, we also have to walk with the limp that comes from understanding the bitter side of the message as well. And what Jesus is saying to his generation is, guys, look, the, the issue is this. John came and I came and you didn't respond to either message. You just heard it. We played the flute and you didn't dance. We did the dirge. You didn't mourn. In the end, your generation is unresponsive. And as it was before the first coming, so too shall it be in the second coming in almost every single dynamic. So we will see this again. Meaning the, the dynamic, the need for there to be a dirge and a response to the bitter sides of the message needs to be manifested in our generation leading up to the days of judgment. Now, when Jesus, in verses 20 through 24, he's talking about specific cities and he's talking about specific judgment events that will take place. Not just in the decades that followed his ministry, but at the end of the age. He jumps to the eschaton in his defense of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a prefiguring of the prophetic expression of the time of judgment and Jacob's trouble at the end that will impact literal cities in the land of Israel. I'll give you an example of the flute and the, the dirge and the bitter and the sweet, how these go together. Because when we look at specifically the Old Testament passages, and I say specifically the Old Testament because the New Testament is not introducing almost anything new about eschatology. Whenever Jesus spoke about it, he's just quoting the Old Testament. So we don't actually have a lot of new information in the New Testament that's not a direct, explicit quote from the Old. In the book of Joel, Nikolai referenced it last night, in Joel chapter 2, how many of you have heard the prophecy of, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit, There'll be dreams and visions. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. How many of you have heard that message? We've heard that, right? That's Pentecost. We've, we've heard the Pentecost message. We've heard of 
dreams and visions and your young men and your, your maidservants and the Holy Spirit is for everybody. We've heard that message. We stop there though. What's the next verse? There will be blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. We have a propensity to proclaim Holy Spirit is coming, dreams and visions, yay, 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 and to put a period on it where the prophets did not put a period. They didn't even put a comma. They just kept speaking. Yes, there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to be in the context of blood, fire, and smoke. Pillars of smoke, for you as Americans, you, you know, your image that's in, in, ingrained in your mind is the, the photos and the video footage from that morning in September 2001. Columns of smoke rising out of Manhattan. Have that image in your mind. Actual people's death through an actual territorial physical conflict crisis, that's the description, the landscape that Jesus sets as the backdrop to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In that passage, he describes the division of the land of Israel, the deportation of the Jewish community, and the near extermination of the population in Jerusalem during the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's very heavy. We have a propensity to focus on the first parts of prophecy and to ignore the context and the other parts of it. And the question is this, if we're emphasizing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and neglecting the blood, fire, smoke, division of the land, the territorial conflict, the impact on the actual people described in the passages, are we actually representing the outpouring of the Spirit at all? Or a counterfeit version of it? It's no coincidence and I'm, gr I'm so grateful that Nikolai spoke on what he did last night because it's no coincidence that on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in the book of Acts, the passage that the prophets stood up to explain what's happening to everyone is Joel chapter 2 to explain this is a prefiguring of what's to come. Yes, there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but what the book of Acts does not detail for us is the geopolitical landscape of it. What happened after that? What happened after Pentecost? A holocaust. One million Jews were slaughtered in the land. Jerusalem fell. The land was divided. The land was occupied. And for almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people were flung out into the nations and have had centuries of bitter suffering among the Gentiles. And then we shallow, ignorant, naive Christians stand up on our Pentecost Sunday and preach a message about how great it is that the Lord's given us the Holy Spirit and birthed the church at Pentecost, not knowing the context of this thing. The giving of the Holy Spirit is in context to a historical and an eschatological holocaust. The promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is given in context to a historical and an eschatological holocaust. And if we don't recover this, and I say recover because this is, in, in the language of the book of Jude, this is the faith that was once delivered. This is the faith that was once delivered, is the book of Joel. It's the Hebrew prophets, it's the testimony of the prophets. That's what the prophets and the apostles, that when they stood up in Jerusalem to explain what's happening, they point to the eschaton and say, this is a picture of it. It's not yet, but this is the best way that we can explain for you what's happening is to tell you the ultimate end of the story. And I think it's essential right now that we recover this. There are, and I'm, we're, today's gonna be very heavy on Israel. So I, what I'm gonna do is give a bit of a briefing on what Jacob's trouble actually means in the land of Israel a definitive list of events that's going to take place in the land of Israel. We're going to break from this. We'll go back into time of worship. And then Marco's going to come up. Jeff is going to come up. And we're going to un unpack the, well, what then? How do we respond to this in a practical way? And probably one of the things that I've 
am most excited about of anything we've ever done to lay out something that's unfolding in Israel that we want you to be aware of and to participate in in the days ahead. But I wanted to give a context for this because we don't, I don't want to just lay out what we're going to lay out without the context, the end of the story context of this thing. You all understand what I mean when we get there. There's an obscure passage in Isaiah 34, verse 8. Your translations will probably put it in different language. The translation I have here is the one that I think gets to the heart of this thing. It says, For the Lord has a day of vengeance and a year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. The consummation of this present age will be centered around what Isaiah called the controversy of Zion. This issue will take center stage in international affairs in the coming years and will dramatically impact the church and the nations. The Holy Spirit is going to emphasize this issue in a primary way leading up to the generation that will experience it. In Micah chapter 6, the same language is used. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord. And you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Jeremiah 25, it's the same thing in verse 31. A clamor has come to the ends of the earth, because the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He's entering into judgment with all flesh. As for the wicked, he's given them to the sword, declares the Lord. There's a controversy for Zion, there's a controversy that the Lord has with Israel, and there's a controversy that the Lord has with the nations, and they're directly connected. The controversy of Zion is the historical continuum of Gentile contention and divine jealousy over the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and the city of Jerusalem. The source of the controversy is God's historical election of and future commitment to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah and the bloodline of David. The Lord has an appointed time to decisively resolve this controversy. It's called the Day of Vengeance. We refer to it as the Great Tribulation that culminates in the Day of the Lord. There is a day of vengeance. There's days of vengeance. In Luke 21, Jesus says days of vengeance, plural, and there's a day of vengeance. Isaiah 63, it says the day of vengeance is in my heart. The Jesus that we sing to and worship on Sunday mornings, in his heart, is a day of vengeance. In the heart of Jesus is a day of vengeance. This hour of history, of which all the prophets spoke, in which God would restore the kingdom to Israel, first overthrowing the hostile Gentile powers that have for so long oppressed the people of the covenant, Jesus called this the completion of the times of the Gentiles. The hostility of Gentile nations and individuals against the people and the land of Israel will have its most gruesome expression in the generation of the Lord's return. Ezekiel 35 says this, Because you cherished everlasting hatred and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their trouble, at the time of their final chastisement, you hear that language? Because of your everlasting hatred, and you've given the people over, the people of Israel over to the power of the sword at the time of their suffering, at the time of their final chastisement, the final one, the last one. Because of that, I will prepare you for blood, and blood will pursue you. 
because you did not hate bloodshed, therefore blood shall pursue you. What the Lord is saying is that in the final generation, he's out for blood for those who have shed the blood of the Jewish people in their final time of suffering. This is heavy. Blood will pursue you. This is the gospel of the kingdom. We think of the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in in the days ahead as going to be, you know, the four spiritual laws or something. Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom in the days ahead looks like saying, blood will pursue you. And the Messiah is going to shed your blood for the shedding of the blood of the Jewish people. If, if you're not connecting the dots, that's not going to go down well. You know, you, 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 we read about these passages about the persecution of the church, and we think, oh, it's because we're, we're so, you know, lovely and fruitful and anointed, and that's why there's going to be so much persecution in the days ahead. The primary reason for persecution in the days ahead will be our identification with Israel and our prophetic stance and proclamation regarding her suffering and her vindication. And the consequences of the Gentile nations for shedding the blood of the Jewish people, dividing the land of Israel, and attempting to eradicate them. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Don't take this to a place I'm not saying it, but I I want you to hear what I am saying. Many people during this time period of history are going to lose their lives not because of Jesus, but because of Jesus' command to stand with the Jewish people. The wave of martyrdom that will come at the end is not actually connected to Jesus and the cross and the Father and the Holy Spirit and the messages that we associate with modern Christianity. The backlash that will hit the church at the end will be directly and most prominently and visibly and demonstrably connected to the church's identification with Israel. That's why the persecution will be so rampant. The nations are not going to hate you because you love Jesus. To be very frank and crass, the nations don't give a shit about what you think about Jesus. They don't care. One of the things that surprised me moving to the Middle East was I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to be so, people are going to, they're going to find out I love it. No one cares. Nobody cares. No one cares. You know what they care about? that you're potentially in bed with the Zionists. That's what's going to get you killed. Not your association with Jesus. Nobody cares, guys. He's the humble carpenter. He's the guy that, right, they killed him? Are you, you're stupid, but that's okay. But that's no threat to us. You guys are pacifists. You're the idiots that follow the guy that got crucified. That's not a threat to us. You know what's a threat to us? The fact that you guys like the Zionists. That you're in bed with the colonizers. That you're in bed with the occupiers. That you're in bed with the devil. That's what's going to get you killed. And that's what's going to push you to the brink of apostasy at the end as well if you don't care about it. What's going to divide the true church at the end of the age is not actually going to be the issue of Jesus. It's going to be the issue of Israel, which is the issue of Jesus. People go, oh, it's just about Jesus. Guys, he's Jewish. And he's returning to Jerusalem. The issue is Jerusalem. I'm, I, I'm, I was going to say I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I'm wanting to put it in crass terms for you. Because there's a, an illusion that we have a persecution complex in the church. And, you know, we've done films about persecution and things like that. I want to give you a clip. Like, persecution, guys, in the Middle East, it's, it's really actually hard to get persecuted in the Middle East. The Middle East is such a tolerant place in general, like religiously. You want to know why? Because you have differing faiths living next to each other for thousands of years. They're totally okay with it. They're okay with it. 
You know what they're not okay with? Is when people begin to step out of their box because these are religious boxes, right? No, no, it's fine. You're a Christian. You're a Muslim. You're a Jew. Stay in your box. Everything's cool. It's when someone steps out of their box who's supposed to be an anti-Semitic Muslim, for example, and says, well, I, I kind of like the Jewish Messiah now, which means I kind of love Israel. That's when persecution hits. As long as you're in your box, you can be a Christian, you can follow Jesus, you can follow, you can drink goat's blood if you want, you can do whatever you want, you can handle snakes, you can be a Hare Krishna, whatever. The Middle East, guys, the West is way more intolerant and dangerous than the Middle East is. The Middle East knows hospitality and honor. So if you believe something different and you're honorable about it, you will be met with honor. You're not going to get persecuted for following Jesus. You're going to get persecuted for standing with Israel, which is following Jesus. <laughs> Jeremiah 30 says this, These are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, we've heard a cry of panic, of terror, and of no peace. Panic, terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man give birth to a child? Then why do I see every man in the land of Israel with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why is every face turned pale? Alas, that day is great, there's none like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Yet Jacob will be saved out of it. So I'm starting here before we move into a, a list because Jeremiah emphasizes both the bitter and the sweet. There's a time of unprecedented trouble coming, but Jacob will be saved out of it. Today, I'm not focusing on the he will be saved out of it because that one is all over and you can read that yourself and you can go study it and that's... It's still underdeveloped and neglected, the subject of the salvation of Israel. But the reason why I'm going to focus on the negative side of it today is because it's undeveloped. And in the pro-Israel Christian community, not only is it underdeveloped, it's actually scoffed at and despised the subject of Jacob's trouble among many in the Western, specifically American, pro-Israel community. Meaning we love to talk about the blessings of Israel and they'll never be uprooted from the land and God's commitment to Israel. And then we just turn a blind eye to all of the bitter sides of that message, which is the time of Jacob's suffering. And if we're ignorant of it or if we're unwilling to even consider the reality of it, not only are we unprepared for it, we're misrepresenting God and we're not actually loving Israel. Much of the pro-Israel sentiment in America is shallow patriotism. It's not actually a faithful witness of God's heart for them. Why? Because it's built on the rejection of the prophecies concerning the people that we're saying we love. You can't reject the prophecies concerning the people you love and say we love them. You're sentimental towards them. There's a difference. I've lived in Israel for the last, I don't know, seven years or something like that. And one of the things that makes my skin crawl, and don't, don't take this somewhere, I, I don't intend to take it, okay? And, and don't feel judged or like I'm being mean to you if you've come to Israel on a tour before, okay? If you come to Israel on a tour before, it's okay. But one of the things that just really makes me, uh, is every day watching on the road in front of my house, all the Christian tour buses drive in and out of the Golan Heights. And watching all of the, the Christians with their fanny packs and their expedition vests on going to hike to the coffee shop to express their love for Israel before they buy t-shirts and trinkets from the Arab crooks who are just trying to exploit them because of their naive, sentimental love for the Jews. And they're going to spend $300 on a postcard in the old city because it has Jesus' sweat on it or something. I'm saying that to say this, that the primary expression of American love for Israel over the last few decades 
looks more like Disneyland than it does the book of Acts. We treat Israel like Disneyland. You go get on the bus, you go buy the t-shirt, you go spend your money, you bring your kids, you go to the swimming pool. You have no connection with Israelis, no connection to the land itself, and half the places you're going to aren't even actual biblical places because the Catholics just made one so they can take money from the naive Christians who believe that maybe this is where Jesus came and did something. And there's really only like a couple places that are actually the places where it happened. <laughs> wow, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. No, that's just some random hill that some Catholic guy said, well, that's a great place for a tourist trap. I want to ask you, I'm not saying don't come to Israel on tours. What I'm saying is, this is representing something to the Jewish people and to the state of Israel that this is how we relate to them. It's almost like a zoo. Let's get on the bus and go look at the Jews. Oh wow, look at the Jews, look at the kids hold rifles everywhere. Can I take a picture with them? Like they're gorillas or something in a cage. It's wrong, guys. The Christian tourism industry, this might sound weird that I'm going after this right now, but I think it's right. The Christian tourism industry to Israel cannot be the tip of the spear of engaging the Jewish people in our generation. It's an abomination. It's actually embarrassing and disgraceful and requires repentance. Now, don't feel judged for coming to Israel on tour. you like, it, it's amazing to go to Israel and see the places. It's amazing. That cannot be the front line of our engagement with the state of Israel, not in light of what's coming. And even if it wasn't for what's coming, it's still just tacky <laughs> and stupid. Think about it. Well, we love, we love the Jewish people. Okay, how? Uh, well... We go to John Hagee's Kufi conference every year, and um, we watch all the pro-Israel shows on the Christian television, and we give lots of money to the guy when he asks for it, and none of that money actually goes anywhere useful anyway, but it goes to line the pockets of the pro-Israel Christian uh, organizations that are actually, a lot of them, crooks. And that's how we express our love for Israel. Meanwhile, we deny what the scriptures actually say is happening. That's not love for Israel, guys. I don't even know what that is. That's not even like, that's just Americans being naive or something. That's not even naivety. I don't even know what that is. You can't watch guys on TV and send them money and say, oh, that's standing with Israel. Oh, I, I got a coin with Donald Trump's face on it saying something about standing with Israel. That's not standing with Israel. That's you being a political American who bought a trinket on TV. And going to Israel on a tour, as amazing as it is, cannot be the primary way that we as the international Christian community relate to the Jewish people. Now, if you're not in that camp, be like, man, don't judge me. I've never done that. I'm not judging you. I'm saying as a cultural reality, this thing needs to be dismantled. The Christian tourism industry to Israel needs to be dismantled and overhauled and repurposed and recalibrated. Come to Israel, but don't treat the Jewish people like animals in cages, and don't treat the land of Israel like it's a, a, a theme park in Orlando. It's not. It's the epicenter of God's purposes in time and eternity, and real lives and real blood are connected to it. I want to leave it there and not qualify because it's always the challenge of preaching. You want to emphasize something, but then you always want to qualify it. Like, we lead tours to Israel, guys. I'm not saying don't come to Israel on a tour. Like, Joel's leading one in a couple months. Half of you in the room are going on tours in some capacity in the next couple months. I'm not saying tours are... Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? The heart of the thing? I'm trying to be 
mm, disruptive about it because if I'm if I'm domesticated and political and diplomatic about it, we're not going to feel the gravity of it. You can say, no, it's okay. You can still, you know, tours are great. There's nothing wrong with tours, but it's a challenge to communicate it. So, and if I'm communicating it poorly or I overshoot the runway, have mercy on me. I'm trying to convey a burden that I feel every morning when I'm taking my kids to school and I see the tour buses driving into the Golan and driving out of the Golan in the evenings and going, this is, this is embarrassing. That's the question. You're, we're getting there, guys. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I'm going to, what, how can we change it? How can we engage? That's what the rest of today is about. I'm going to give a as if it were a situation briefing of what's going to happen, just from Old Testament passages. This is what the Jewish scriptures say. I'm just going to lay it out in cold, matter-of-fact terms in terms of the territorial impact of the final time of trouble. In terms of events, because I want this to be the context of what, what when we talk about our response to it, this is what we have in the back of our head. This is where the, the train is going to. The train's not at this destination yet, but this is where it's going to. Order of events. In the days ahead, there's going to be a regional alliance between Israel and a number of Arab nations that will be led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt that will form and provoke a counter alliance. So, what Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel said, we'll put these notes available on, online somehow after the fact, and you guys can go through all the verses yourselves. I'm just going to give you the, the headline of the event and reference the passage. You go read it yourself. But this is what the, the prophets described. The Arabian Peninsula and Egypt, Jordan, modern day, I'll use, I'm going to use modern day lang, names of the n nation states. They didn't exist then. But the territories that were described in the book of Isaiah is the modern day nation states of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. These nations are going to form an alliance with Israel. It will be Saudi led. And this alliance, which is, to, I mean, Egypt has been in a peace agreement with Israel for decades, led the way. Jordan has been in a peace agreement with Israel. They already have diplomatic, economic, they have great relationships. You, you see on the news all the stuff, but at the end of the day, there's deep coordination between these countries. The, the connection between the Israelis and the Egyptians and the Jordanians is a very, very strong relationship. The Saudi relationship is very strong behind the scenes and it's going to become very public in the days ahead. And this, once the Saudi peace goes public, it's going to be a game changer. This formation, and we don't know how far off it is, but Isaiah said it's going to happen. That's the game changer, is when Saudi steps into the, into the, the world stage and that agreement goes into effect. That's going to provoke a counter-alliance in the Middle East. It's going to form a coalition of nations that do not support that. Now, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Psalm 83, specifically Ezekiel 38 and 39, actually name the nations that will be a part of this coalition to counter the Saudi-Egyptian-Israeli alliance. It will be led by Turkey and Iran, probably not configured the way that Turkey and Iran are configured today, but we're going to see an alliance of 10 nations that will coordinate diplomatically very, very quickly in response to the Saudi alliance. When that happens, there's going to be, it's going to move towards a season of unprecedented peace diplomatically, politically, economically in the Middle East. There might be a or multiple military conflicts before then to set the context for it. I assume there will be a big one soon that will realign the equilibrium of the region and set the context for the alliance to take place. There will be peace agreement between the, 
let's say the Israeli-Saudi block, and let's call it the Turkish-Iranian block. He said, Turkey and Iran, those guys are da-da-da-da. I'm just telling you what the scripture says, and if you can do, lick your thumb and put it in the air, you can see where these things are going today. And the Saudi-Egyptian-Israeli alliance will provoke very interesting things in the neighboring countries, both positively and negatively. It will be heralded as a new era of human history. And it will be, and many things about it will be very, very amazing. Like, amazing. You know, the Abraham Accords recently, it's, it's really, really cool for Israelis to be able to fly to Morocco or Dubai now, go to UAE, because for the first time you can now travel to these countries because the Abraham, there's now a peace agreement. There's economic relationship. There's tourism. There's all kinds of stuff. It's, it's cool. It's great. And the, the, in, this day, in these days when this goes down, there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff about it. Well, that's fantastic. Imagine being at the, the potential of driving from Tel Aviv to the beach in Saudi Arabia for the weekend. Think, think about that. <laughs> it's crazy. It's something like that kind of regional shift is going to take place in the days ahead. I don't know how far out it is. And, but it will happen. This 10-nation coalition will form. When the coalition forms, a peace agreement will form between the two blocs, these two main parties, the Israel Alliance and the one that is not aligned with Israel. That peace agreement will be broken. When the peace agreement is broken, there will be 42 months of military conflict specifically 1,260 days to be precise, of the most brutal season of history for both the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and the nations of the earth. It will be kicked off when this peace agreement is violated. Ezekiel says that this peace agreement will be violated from the north side of Israel, from the mountains of the north. The Golan Heights will be violated first. Enemy forces will violate the northern border and will occupy the north and will begin to use the north as a staging area for the assault on Jerusalem. You know, you've heard Armageddon. It's, it's, a, it's a big field in front of the mountain. The mountain of, and the field. That field is going to be used to stage for the military assault. It's not, there's not a battle on that field. You know, people talk about the battle of Armageddon. There's no battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is where the military conquest is going to be staged after the Golan Falls. So when the north part of the country falls and is occupied, military forces will occupy the upper Galilee area. Then the military forces will move to cut the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 11 describes this in very, like, it's very vivid language. He says that the, that the Antichrist is going to establish his palatial tents in between the holy city and the Mediterranean. Now, if you draw a line from Jerusalem to the Mediterranean, you're actually drawing a line where the highway goes. Ben-Gurion Airport is right in the middle of that. Ben-Gurion Airport will be seized and occupied. The road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem will be cut, and military forces will occupy that area. That's what Daniel describes. At that time, Daniel also describes that there will be a mass exodus out of Israel to the south into the nations that are in the alliance with them. Isaiah chapter 19 describes Egypt harboring a mass exodus of Jews leaving the state of Israel. Daniel 11, the book of Micah, the book of Isaiah also describes at that time the mass exodus out of the south of Israel through the mountains of Judea into the Arabian Peninsula into the territories of modern-day Jordan and the northwest part of the, the nation-state of Saudi Arabia. There will be an unprecedented refugee crisis that will move south as the block, the coalition of nations stages in the north. Egypt will fall. Isaiah 19 describes the collapse of Egypt as the Antichrist initiates an assault on Egypt because Egypt stands with Israel in this time. Saudi Arabia will collapse as well. It says that the, the, that the, the day the peace agreement is broken in Matthew 24, 
and the abomination of desolation is set up and the invading forces begin the assault on Jerusalem, it says at that time he also attacks the harlot Babylon. There's going to be an economic alliance with the state of Israel with certain friendly nations. And the Ten Nation Coalition is going to hit Israel and the nations that are in economic agreement with Israel. Because it's in their interest to, to remain connected with Israel, those who are in the agreement, in the alliance, in the alliance with Israel, the economic alliance that forms in the days ahead, in the, let's call it the apocalyptic Abraham Accords, that continues to evolve into this time of peace and prosperity and wealth and, 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 and. The Ten Nation Coalition is going to go after that thing to try to break it up. And when they go to try to break it up, a big part of this is going to be hitting the capital cities of these nations. So Jordan is going to get hit. Daniel 11 describes Jordan as being a harboring place where the Jewish people, they flee into the wilderness and they're protected there. Isaiah 19 describes protective elements in Egypt when the assault is taking place on Egypt. Daniel 11 describes that there's going to be a military intervention from Europe at that time that will be maritime. So there's naval presence. Daniel 11 describes naval intervention from Europe to block this because it's in Europe's interest that the Saudi-Israel-Egyptian alliance does not crumble because the world will be benefiting from this. The economic prosperity that will come from this peace agreement that the Ten Nation Coalition is going to attack, this peace agreement is going to be something that the nations of the earth are very much drinking from. They, they need to prop this thing up and they need to intervene from the assault. That intervention will fail, Daniel describes. We have this idea that the Antichrist is sort of this like uh, invincible guy that everyone worships and adores and the whole world goes, hey, that, that guy's great. Let's follow the Antichrist. That's not how the Bible describes the man of sin. It describes a, a very normal political situation like we've seen in human history. It's a, World War II is a dress rehearsal. A man rises, coalitions are formed, an invasion of a specific territory kicks things off, and then everyone picks their sides, and then it turns into a, a regional bar fight. Okay, we're, 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 with, we're with the Allies, we're with the Russians, we're with the Germans, we're with the Americans, French, where are you guys going? Everyone picks their sides and stands off and goes into it. That's what's going to happen when the Antichrist attacks the Israeli-Saudi-Egyptian alliance. Everyone's going to pick a side and it's not going to be the sort of thing where when it, in Revelation when it says the whole world worships the beast, don't take that phrase to mean, you know, the Fijians are watching CNN going like, yeah, totally, we should worship that guy. That's great. It doesn't mean that everyone in the world is going to bow down and go, we love the Antichrist. He's going to be met with fierce resistance. Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12 describe the frustration in his heart because his attack on Egypt fails. He's turned back. It says he comes back with rage in his heart towards the Holy Covenant when his attack on Egypt is met with fierce resistance because the Egyptians put up a fight. The king of the north and the king of the south clash. And in the eye of the storm is the fledgling state of Israel fighting for survival. Zechariah 14 describes the division of the city of Jerusalem into two parts. Read Zechariah 14, it's very heavy. Half of the city, the city will be divided, half of the city will be deported, half of the city will remain, it says. You go to Jerusalem today, you see, the, see it, and you, you pull open Zechariah 14, you go, half of the city, half of the city's... Guys, what will it look like to see the city of Jerusalem, half of the city of Jerusalem emptied? You say, well, Alton, I don't agree with your interpretation. I don't care. That's what Zechariah said. It's, you believe whatever you want. Believe whatever you want. I would like this to not be true. I'm not saying it, and there's no celebratory thing in me that's saying it. I'm saying it because I believe it, because it's very simple. Like, there's no interpretation required here. Guys, read it yourself. Pick it up. Read Zechariah 14. 
And what's the comment? He said, well, I believe that happened in history. What, what happens after Jerusalem is divided? It says Messiah comes and he slaughters the nations that violated her. That didn't happen yet. <laughs> well, I believe it happened in 70 AD. Really? Really? That happened in 70 AD? Jerusalem will be divided, Jerusalem will be occupied. There will be a resistance force that remains in Jerusalem up until the end, but it will collapse at the very end. Three days before the end, to be precise. With the death of the two witnesses, the resistance, kind of like in the Warsaw Ghetto, there will be an uprising, a resistance that will, will hold through the 42 months. Up to the end, it says that there's going to be two men, two leaders in the city of Jerusalem who will give a very interesting demonstration in those days. They too shall be killed and their bodies will be left for three days. Isaiah 52 describes the, the breaking of Israel's defense forces. It says, your young men will be at the head of every street as the invading forces are pushing into the city. And it says the resistance will fail in Isaiah 52. It describes them as deer or gazelle or animals that have been running and they have no water and they're panting. That's the description of the defense forces at the end of the military campaign. Isaiah 42 and 49, chapter 60, 63, 65, Ezekiel 38, 39, and many more passages describe in vivid detail the establishment of concentration camps in and around Israel. Isaiah chapter 42 and 49 describe, it says, on the day of the Lord, those who are in camps and in prisons will be released. If you're in camps and you're in prisons, it presupposes the establishment of prisons and camps. When you deport a population of that size and you move a population of that size, you need to deal with a population of that size. Daniel chapter 8 describes, says, he will go forth and destroy many in those days, the destruction of many. I don't like talking about any of this. I don't, want, I don't want to talk about any of this. It would be nice to talk about something else. But if we're going to talk about standing with the Jewish people, loving the Jewish people, let's at least be honest about it and clear-eyed about what we're talking about. There will be economic sanctions imposed globally on anyone who does not comply with the coalition's policies. We call this the mark of the beast. That's the fanciful term for it, but it's economic sanctions on anyone that doesn't comply with the regime. The regime will be no economic relations with the Zionists because we're going to destroy the Zionists. So a big part of the mark of the beast has, as I mentioned earlier, has nothing to do with Jesus. These economic sanctions are going to affect the world's food source, which is going to, in turn, you can read it in Revelation 6. You guys know the sequence of events in Revelation 6 that follows after the peace agreement is broken. Economic collapse, food shortage, then we have massive death toll that comes from pestilence, sickness and disease that's going to break out. I remember when we were in Iraq, there were seasons where the Iraqi security forces at the beginning when ISIS took control of some of the, the major cities like Tikrit and Ramadi and Mosul, the, the Iraqi army just collapsed like that. And so what happened is the Shia government just recruited every able-bodied male possible to go resist so that ISIS couldn't keep taking more territory. So all these young Shia men came and, and volunteered. And I still remember watching it live, seeing it unfold, going, my goodness, this is crazy, seeing 16-year-old kids in droves. 
And what they did to hold the territory in places like Ramadi or Tikrit, it was just Viking style, just sending these kids in. And the amount of bodies that collected of these kids that were gunned down trying to take back to Crete. In the end of it, and Ramadi was a terrible one, the Battle of Ramadi was brutal. The Ministry of Defense never released the numbers of the death toll because of how many young Iraqi men were killed during that time. They came with bulldozers to bulldoze all of the bodies into piles and then to cover the bodies. The problem is in the heat and the amount of the bodies and the flies were coming and the flies began to feast on the, all of the bodies and the flies began to spread around Iraq. So we started to see even you know, hours away in different places, people's skin were starting to get rashes on their skin from flies landing on them that were feasting on the flesh of the dead teenagers down in Ramadi. And I remember the first time it came into one of our clinic and we're like, what is, what is that? And they're like, this is this, that flesh-eating thing. And some of the Kurds were like, oh yeah, that's the flesh-eating thing. That's from all the dead bodies. And it just started spreading. And then, then the Iraqis were like, we got to figure out a way to cover up. There's so many bodies. We have to deal with it more efficiently and more quickly so that it doesn't affect. My point is this. War is a health issue. <laughs> In practical terms, that's my point. The military situation is going to bring severe impact in terms of global health issues. And, and, uh, and uh, no disrespect here to Mr. Fauci or something like that, but uh, the COVID thing was nothing compared to what's coming in terms of the global impact of that thing. Nothing. You guys think like lockdowns and masks and stuff? Guys, flesh-eating diseases from millions of dead bodies? That's actually what we're talking about, is millions of dead bodies. Ezekiel 39 says it takes seven months to clean up the dead bodies around Jerusalem. Seven months. Like the scriptures are so detailed about this. Revelation chapter 12 says that Israel will flee into the wilderness. Jeremiah 31 says, in the wilderness of the nations, there she will find grace. Hosea chapter 2 says, I will allure you into the wilderness. We like to write romantic worship songs about that. I will allure you into the wilderness and betroth you to me. It says, because they're chasing you with the sword. It's hard to make that one romantic. It's beautiful what the Lord's saying is in the context of the wilderness, or Ezekiel chapter 20 and 22 describes as in the wilderness of the nations, I will meet with you face to face. Again, I'm not, you say, Dalton, why are you only hitting the bad stuff? All these passages have positive sides to it. I know that. I love them. We'll, we'll talk about those another time. But these passages are the passages that are not talked about. And because they're not talked about, they're not considered. Because they're not considered, we can't ameliorate them into our lives and into our convictions, into our reaction and response to them. So I, it's not like I have a, a, a lust for the, the heavy stuff where I'm trying to be like, like edgy or something. This sucks, talking about this. But I believe it's absolutely necessary so that we can posture rightly in the days ahead and we are aware of the cost of it when we say we're going to do this or we're going to do that. Because you need to make a decision now whether you're going to stand. This is what's coming. In Revelation 12, I'm, I'm winding this down, which is the preacher's way of saying I have 45 more minutes to go. <laughs> no, I only have a few more. I have many more, but I think you guys get the point. But I want to emphasize one, one key thing that I have not addressed yet. And that is in Revelation chapter 12, 17, and 18, it says that when... Israel flees into the wilderness of the nations, it says that the wrath of the dragon will go after those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. It emphasizes that distinctly. It says Israel will flee into the wilderness and his wrath will be provoked with great fury and that wrath will be aimed at those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Because if you hold to the testimony of Jesus, 
it means that you've yoked your, you've hitched your wagon to the people who are fleeing into the wilderness. There will be a mandate to not only stand with them and it's not about political advocacy, guys. It's not about, you know, standing in some political way. It's not that. It's going to be something much more demanding. Being political is easy. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it because it's like sports. People are bored. So you get into politics because you're bored like a sports team, you know? You don't care if your team sucks. It's just, it's your team. And you, you've, you know, you've been with your team forever and so you can't switch teams now. So our politics is kind of like that. So is our theology, by the way. You've never actually thought about it. You don't have an open mind to process the actual heart of the matter. You're actually just bored and you need a team. There's a lot of believers who are bored and who have picked a theological or a political team related to Israel, either for them or against them. Don't be that person. Don't be a political advocate for Israel who's not willing to give your life in the days when this stuff unfolds. Your political sentiment means nothing to the Jewish people. Your political solidarity with the state of Israel means nothing if you're not willing to give your life for it. It will become an issue of martyrdom, not an issue of politics. And World War II is a dress rehearsal. Because in the same way that the Christian community in Germany and in Poland and in other countries and the, watch the trains drive by back and forth transporting the Jews and they watched out of their stained glass windows in their churches and they just sang louder so they couldn't hear the trains when they drove by. In the same way, that dynamic will play out again. You can sing louder and ignore it. You can put, become a part of the regime and bow your knee to it and be a coward and pay for it dearly. or you can take a stand with and for Israel in a biblical way, which may cost you your life, but will definitely guarantee you an eternal reward. The landing point on this, and worship team, you guys can come on up. The landing point on this, all of this is this. Heavy days are coming and there is a massive responsibility for the international Christian community to completely overhaul what we think about standing with Israel and how we do it. I'm going to say that again and try to say it in different language. In light of what's coming, it is essential in these days that we, I'm going to use a very unpopular word, but I'm going to use it intentionally that we deconstruct American Christian Zionism because it's weak. Now, people are saying you should, we should deconstruct American Christian evangelicalism because it's too strong. <laughs> because you shouldn't be supported. I mean, think about that. That's going to put you in some very hot water. <laughs> the nations of the earth today are saying we hate the Christian. The, who else stands with Israel? Who else loves the Jewish people? Who else is going to support the Zionists? It's, it's just the Christians. But the overwhelming expression of that is actually too weak to matter. <laughs> That's the irony of it. So we need to deconstruct it, not because for the reasons they're saying it needs to be deconstructed. We need to deconstruct it because it's too weak. It's too shallow. It's too Disney World. It's too self-serving. It's too entertainment driven and it's too antichrist. Why is it antichrist? Because it's against, it's anti the heart of Jesus. American Christian Zionism in its current sentimental state is riding the fence of an antichrist spirit that denies the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, and the essential dynamics and the raw and prophetic ingredients of the day of the Lord and Jacob's trouble. Which is probably why we're seeing the collapse 
of the last generation's expression of Christian Zionism. If any of you guys have been to the pro-Israel Christian conferences or tours lately and you look around and you do the math, you go, who's the youngest person in this room? <laughs> That's how long we've got until this thing's gone. The generation is dying off. My generation doesn't care about it at all. And if they do care about it, they care about it in a different way. They think the colonialists and the Zionists and the, and the, and the, and the, and the are, the par are part of the problem. So in closing, what I'm submitting to you theologically and then what we want to present to you practically is the idea that over the next 10 years, we need to completely dismantle Western Christian Zionism and rebuild something that's worthy of the name of Jesus because what currently exists is an embarrassment.